Okay, um, we're going to change pace a little bit. We're going to move to animals and we're going to move back to Darwin. And I'm going to talk about the amphibians and reptiles of the voyage of the Be Eagle. And um, in contrast to what we just heard about botany, we'll find out that Darwin was a terrible herpetologist. <laughs> um, his knowledge of herpetology before the voyage was very minimal. Um, which would be expected from his background. There wasn't much going on in herpetology in Britain at the time. Um, when he was on board the Beagle, he relied primarily on Cuvier's Regne Animal as his main source. Um, his comments in the Journal of Researches and in Voyage of the Beagle were quite limited, his comments on amphibians and reptiles. And post-voyage, his knowledge of reptiles came almost exclusively from the people listed here, Bell, who you'll see in a minute, uh, Biberon, who's on the left, uh, Gunther, who's second from the left, Blythe, uh, third, and then on the, on the far right, uh, Andrew Smith. And these were primarily people that he contacted for his comments about amphibians and reptiles in later works. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on uh, what we know about the voyage of the Beagle itself. In the Voyage of the Beagle, there are about 30 references to reptiles or amphibians that are made in the book, mostly in passing, a little bit more on things like marine iguanas and on tortoises, but not very much. Most of what's been published about the Voyage of the Beagle with respect to reptiles was published by Bell, you see there, um, in volume five of the Zoology of the Beagle. And in that, he dealt only with lizards and frogs, did not deal with snakes, did not deal with amphisbenids, and he, in fact, did not actually deal with all the lizards and frogs. He only dealt with those that he thought were interesting, which were primarily those that had never been illustrated before. And so that work, which came out in 1842 and 43, was primarily what was published from the results of the Beagle voyage itself. Excuse me. <clears throat> Gray in 1845 at the British Museum in the catalog of lizards and then subsequently in other catalogs mentioned Darwin specimens from the Beagle, but added relatively little. And then in 1975, there was a facsimile reprint done of The Voyage of the Beagle that had uh, a new preface by Donoso Barros, uh, who gave some additional background about some of the specimens involved. And this is basically the sum total of what's been published about the herpetology of the beagle. Nobody has ever gone back and looked at those specimens and published on those specimens again, except in the context of individual species revisions where somebody may have looked at a, a Darwinian specimen. And so uh, Colin McCarthy, who some of you uh, who are, have a long association with the Natural History Museum might know, Colin and I started a, a program to try and go back through all of Darwin's amphibian reptile material and try to make some sense of it. Um, it was obvious that a lot of the material was in the collection with minimal data, but in fact those data exist scattered around in Darwin's notes and Darwin's publications, and to try to put this all back together so that we could go through the Natural History Museum's collection and be able to say, this specimen corresponds to this collection date and this spot, rather than say, Patagonia, which is what a lot of the specimens say. Uh, that's the data that are, that are available. So that's sort of the background of sort of why we're interested in this. Um, and the sources that we have were primarily published sources and manuscript sources, which I'll talk about first, and then, of course, the specimens themselves. And this is a, a work in progress. We're almost done with this, but we've got a couple of uh, interim uh, results that I'll, I'll focus on. Uh, to begin with, for manuscript sources, there were Darwin's notebooks, field notebooks, his zoology notes, uh, specimens and spirits of wine, all of which have been published in various forms. And there's a British Museum, Natural History Museum manuscript, Reptiles and Spirits of Wine, which to date has not been published in its entirety. And this has some interesting information in it. Uh, this is a page from it. Sorry that it's so, so faint. Most of the, the, this manuscript is in the hands of Sims Covington, who was Darwin's assistant. Um, and this is nearly verbatim from the zoology notes and specimen notebooks. In other words, these other sources were cobbled together and written together in this document in a sort of clearer, slightly more extensive form than in the original notebooks. And it was this document that Bell used as the basis for his information about locality data, color notes of the animals, and natural history details. So this was really a document that Darwin and Bell were using to get things ready for the publication of the reptiles of the Voyage of the Beagle. <clears throat> 
Um, most of this, as I said, was in, in the hands of Sims Covington, but some notes are in Darwin's hand. Um, and the notes that deal with lizards and frogs were largely taken almost verbatim by Bell and put into the published version of the, the uh, Zoology of the Beagle. There were notes on snakes as well, sometimes quite extensive notes on snakes, but none of those have ever been reported before. And this was because Bell did not feel comfortable working on snakes. Bell was a, a turtle specialist, a tortoise specialist, um, was interested in lizards, but was not that interested in snakes. And he sent almost all of the specimens of snakes, as well as amphisbenids, worm lizards, from the void to Biberon in Paris. Uh, and used none of that information in the reptiles of the beagle. So there's no mention of snakes or amphisbenids in the reptiles of the beagle. Um, we know that this document was used by both Darwin and Bell in the, this compilation of the, the reptiles of the beagle because facing pages in this manuscript have Bell's notes uh, in which he annotated things, had comments, provided in, uh, identifications of the specimens when he could, and had notes about specific uh, individual specimens that he wanted more information on. Um, and these were primarily notes to do with those species that he decided needed to be illustrated in the reptiles of the beagle. Uh, in response to some of Bell's questions on the manuscript, you see Darwin writing sort of scribbles on the side where he provided additional locality information Usually these things were, as I said, specifically in response to things that Bell had asked about. Um, so for example, uh, Bell questioned whether Darwin's numbers were this or that. He couldn't read them very clearly. And if any of you have ever looked at Darwin's reptile tags, um, which are on, printed on metal or stamped on metal, it can actually be quite difficult to tell whether something is a six or a zero or whether it's an eight or a nine. Uh, and so Bell had those questions as well. Um, and ultimately, Bell prepared a sequential list, a numerical list, of all of Darwin's material with his identifications. And I just highlighted there, you can see again, Bell was not a snake person because the snakes were just listed as snake. Um, so all of this material, all the relevant snake material, had been sent off to Paris. Um, now, turning to the specimens themselves, and the catalog information for specimens, and this would, would seem to be the most important source of information we have. Luckily, the year in which Darwin gave the bulk of his material from uh, the Beagle Voyage was 1837, which was also the year in which specimens that were received were centrally registered and given the numbers that people who worked with um, specimens in the Natural History Museum would be familiar with. Uh, the reptile collection, you typically see numbers like 1837, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.37. So it's a date and then the 37th specimen dealt with on that day. So this is very helpful. And if you look on the left, you can see one of these early registers. Um, and this gives not only the Natural History Museum or British Museum number and the identification, but in the case of something like Darwin's collections where there were field numbers, those field numbers were listed as well. And so ideally, it should be quite easy to identify Darwin's material to go back and say, OK, well, I know that this specimen number corresponds to Darwin's number 164, and this should be this specimen. And I can go into Darwin's field notebook, and I can see when that was collected and where it was collected, and then the project is done. Um, not so easy. And the problem there was J.E. Gray. Um, Gray, who, uh, who was the zoologist dealing with material coming in for reptiles as well as other groups, um, caught, had the material that was coming into the central register copied into smaller notebooks for his own use. Sometimes information was lost in that transfer, and so sometimes numbers were transposed, sometimes places were transposed, and so there was a loss of some information there. But that wasn't the big problem. The big problem was Gray devised a new numbering system using Roman numerals to indicate family, Arabic numbers to indicate species, and then lowercase letters to refer to particular specimens for lizards, which he did, which he published in his catalog of lizards in the British Museum in 1845. Um, and that cited virtually all of Darwin's material that was 
in the collection to that point. There were a few additional specimens that came into the museum as late as about 1854, but most of the material had come in in 1837 and then in drips and drabs up to about the mid-1840s. The problem was Gray's sort of uh, great idea of renumbering everything, he was so convinced that this was the way to do it that he left no record of what the correspondence of his numbers were <laughs> to the original registration numbers or to Darwin's numbers. So the only way that we can actually link these is in cases where we can find Darwin's field tags still attached to the specimens, which is about one-third of the beagle specimens that are extant in the Natural History Museum. Those, it's no problem. Um, in rare cases, Darwin's field numbers were listed on jar labels, um, or in some cases, there is a correspondence between Gray's numbers, the original registration numbers, or Gray's numbers and Darwin's numbers, and we can make those connections there. But unfortunately, that is a a small percentage of the total specimens. The other case is in the case of unique or distinctive specimens where Darwin only had one of a particular species and that is an easily, easily identifiable species, then it's possible to identify that uniquely as uh, the specimen coming from Darwin. And you can see there on the right on the, uh, the back end of this toad, you can see one of Darwin's original tags. So what's left of the specimens from the Voyage of the Beagle. According to Darwin's own field records, there were 282 specimens of amphibians and reptiles collected on the Voyage of the Beagle. And I, just as an aside here, I'll mention an interesting thing for me. I do a lot of work in South Africa, and I was interested to see that although Darwin spent three weeks in South Africa, he only collected about five species of amphibians and reptiles. And the reason why, if you read him, is, is that he says it was already all, all known. It was already, already completely known by that point from his perspective. Uh, Andrew Smith had already been there as curator at the, at the museum in Cape Town, and he was convinced he wouldn't find anything new, so he didn't bother to look. Um, so the 282 specimens really sort of take us through the South American part of the Voyage of the Beagle. By the time he gets to Australia, he's collecting almost no amphibians and reptiles. And again, Australia is the same argument, too well known. I'm not going to find anything interesting here amongst these vertebrates, so I'm not going to bother. So these 282 specimens are primarily South American specimens. 168 of these were registered in the Natural History Museum. At least 18 of these spe specimens appear to be present in Paris. They weren't known to be in Paris. The trouble was, on an, when I asked in Paris and I looked in Paris, there are no specimens associated with Darwin. That's because Darwin gave the specimens to Bell. And then Bell described things and put them back into the museum. And the specimens that Darwin gave to Bell that Bell sent to Paris are listed in Paris as coming from Bell and have no connection back to Voyage of the Beagle, although it's clear that that's what they are. Their only connection in the Paris records are as specimens associated with Bell. There are 18 of those. That includes a few of those missing snakes, but not all of them. We don't know where the rest of the snakes went. Altogether, there are 168 specimens of amphibians and reptiles that are identifiable today. Um, so that's not too bad, 168 of 282. Where might some of the other ones have gone? Well, if you look at this specimen that's cut open there on the, the left-hand side, that's associated with the text that's at the bottom, which indicates black lizard for dissection, specimen for Mr. Owen. So this was a specimen that had been sent to Owen to be dissected, apparently was dissected, but Owen at the time was associated with the College of Surgeons. The specimen went there. Other specimens may have gone to other collections around London, and eventually when those collections folded, like the Zoological Society of London, when the collection ceased to exist, the specimens went to the British Museum. So some of these additional specimens may still be in the Natural History Museum, but may have gone elsewhere, lost their data, and eventually come back. Um, and so we still need to do a little bit of work to find out if any of those might still, still be present. There are seven specimens um, plus two eggs from the Beagle Voyage that came from Captain Fitzroy. Uh, 
Uh, and these were, in fact, the first reptiles that were registered at the British Museum, the first in the modern, that is, the 1837 and later system. These were the very first uh, specimens listed. And that includes uh, this marine iguana here, um, which is PMNH XXII 16A, and I put here probably 1837, 3, 15, 40, because it's one of these cases where Gray renumbered it, and we're not positive that this is, in fact, the registration number that went with this animal. The first material from Darwin himself was registered on the 13th of August, 1837. And I'll mention tortoises here. There are two tortoises, are the first two things by Darwin that were listed here. These are not listed in Darwin's notes, and they're not listed in the specimen lists. According to the registration that you see there, one is from James Island, one is from Charles Island. Fitzroy, however, in 1839, had mentioned that several tortoises were brought alive to England, and that Darwin had stated that young, Darwin also stated that young specimens from three different islands were returned to England. But they were returned alive, and they weren't given specimen numbers. That's why they sort of weren't in any of these specimen lists. The whereabouts of these tortoises uh, was long unknown, and Darwin himself in 1874 said that he didn't bring any tortoises back from the Galapagos, although he had stated clearly in 1839 that he had. And a variety of people had thought that these specimens had either been lost, had died in the British winter, uh, an argument had been made that they had been exported to Australia because Sims Covington moved to Australia, maybe he took these tortoises with him. So. No specimens of tortoises from Darwin were mentioned by Gray or Gunther or Boulanger or anybody who at, at the British Museum who published various catalogs of the turtles and tortoises at the museum. No mention ever mentioned of this. The only specimens from uh, the Voyage of the Beagle were some sea turtles that uh, were donated by Fitzroy. However, there's one specimen that you can see here. You can see a view from the top and a view from the bottom that was noted as having, coming from, having come from the old collection. In other words, it had no data. They just knew that it was an old specimen. And uh, Colin McCarthy and I found that specimen. And when you opened up the hinged carapace and plastron inside, it has the number 37813, number one, the first specimen cataloged from Darwin's collection. Um, and it says on the lower part, James for James Island. So this is, in fact, the lost tortoise, Darwin's pet tortoise that he brought alive back from, uh, from the Galapagos. It turns out that on his very first visit to Gray, when he came back, he gave Gray the tortoise. And sometime within a very short period of time, Gray killed it and stuffed it and put it into the collection. <laughs> the second tortoise uh, you can actually find as well in the published catalogs is another no data specimen. And it appears in 1844, saying that it's not in great condition. And if you look at the later catalogs, it said, feet bad. And then by, eight, the, by the 1870s, the specimen had been discarded. And that was the second of the small tortoises that made it into the collection. So this was sort of one of our, our sort of findings on our way to putting together our big sort of catalog of everything that, that Darwin did, um, all the specimens that he had collected. The other sort of sort of product on our way to a bigger project is uh, something that uh, I like to call the euthanasia of the beagle. I gave a talk in Italy last year about this, and my opening slide was a Photoshop beagle with a hypodermic needle in it, but I, I'm not sure whether, whether the Italians would understand euthanasia of the beagle and get the double entendre there. But anyway, the, the idea was to identify how Darwin actually killed amphibians and reptiles. Um, and there are at least five different ways that he used, and I'll just finish up with, with, with this. Um, the specimens that you see on the upper left, the lizards there, were drowned in ethanol, uh, drowned alive in ethanol, put in linen bags, and put in a container of ethanol. That was the way it was done. That was standard. If you look at guides on how to prepare specimens from the 19th century, that's one of the main recommendations, drown them in ethanol. So would not pass today's uh, animal care and use committees, but at the time that was considered uh, standard. Uh, he also shot some. You can see a large amoeba there on the lower left. Uh, the little white spots are the dust shot that's inside that animal that's rusting away and causing the spots. Um, and on the lower right, you see a toad. And I've circled there this slit in the back of the toad's head. That is uh, 
a pen knife width slit that has been made to pith the toad or cut the toad's spinal cord, and the larger frogs in Darwin's collection uh, show this. And then uh, the two kind of more interesting examples, the way you kill things on the left, um, this is a lizard from the Andes that Darwin talks about in his field notebooks uh, and has actually been published on because this is a type of a, of a species. And the arrow points to something that you might maybe can make out. That's a mark from a hammer blow. Uh, Darwin actually specifically mentions that he smacked this lizard with a hammer. He was amazed that it didn't run away. Hit it with a hammer. These are live bearing lizards. It caused the animal to abort. He mentions that in his field notes. So we know that this is in fact that very same specimen. Um, and then on the right, this is one of the snakes that's in Paris. Um, and if you look at this, at the neck of the animal, there's a very tight ligature, right? That's not associated with the tag that is around the animal's neck. And this is a case where in Darwin's notes, he mentions that larger snakes he strangled. Uh, and this seems to be the only larger snake. They only have a, a few snakes extant. All the others are quite tiny. This is a large venomous snake from Patagonia and this animal had been strangled. So um, we have, from the specimens themselves, evidence of at least five different ways that Darwin euthanized uh, the reptiles and the amphibians of the beagle. Um, so I'll just finish up here by saying that the herpetological legacy of the voyage of the beagle has really been underappreciated. Uh, and that's largely because Bell was so selective in the organisms that he talked about. Only a fraction of the specimens from the trip were ever published upon. Most of the specimens that were sent to the Natural History Museum, to the British Museum, are accounted for and are extant today, so there was never any great loss over time. Um, and uh, those specimens are, are easily identifiable uh, if you have the connection between Gray's number and Darwin's uh, tag number. Uh, beagle specimens are present in Paris, but they lost their beagle association because they were listed only as having been associated with Bell, coming in from Bell. Most of the amphibians and snakes are still missing. Uh, it's likely they were all sent to Bibron. It's likely that Bibron, who died relatively young, had them in his, in his private collection, private uh, residence, and when he died, the specimens were probably lost and destroyed. Um, some discoveries from the work that we've done, that the reptiles in Spirits of Wine manuscript at the British Museum has some additional information that has never been published before, notes on snakes, for example. Um, the location of Darwin's pet tortoise, unfortunately killed right off the bat, no, no romantic keeping this tortoise alive for a long time. Uh, and then the methods of euthanasia that, that Darwin employed, employed for these organisms. And what's left to do is to Reassociate, reassociate the specimens and their data. And again, this is something we've been working on for about 10 years, uh, and we think we've sort of hit the wall. We've collected all of the data that we can, linked everything that we can link, um, and that accounts for those 160 specimens that are present in London today. There may be more, uh, but if so, some piece is missing in the puzzle, and we think that this is about as far as we could go. So I'd just uh, like to thank Colin McCarthy, my colleague in London, who uh, has been involved with this project all along, uh, Roger Bourg in Paris, Richard Etheridge and Fernando Lobo, uh, Ulysses Karamashi, and then uh, for funding uh, the Gerald Lamole Professorship and uh, the Imperial College in London. So thank you.